Hello. Welcome back to another 100 hours journey of mine. This time we're jumping back into the world of Pokemon as a Pokemon rather than a trainer. We are back in the Mystery Dungeon universe, ready to discover uncharted territories as an exploration team with our partner. Much like our previous 100 hour journeys, we have to set some goals for our time here in Treasure Town and beyond. It helps us give this adventure more clarity. Aside from racking up 100 hours in the game, the main objective of this video is to complete the adventure icons displayed during the adventure status. And by that, I mean this collection of icons here. To get every single icon milestone here, we would need to save the planet, save the planet again, and gather the seven treasures. Beyond the adventure icons, I would also like to complete three additional things. Reach Guildmaster Exploration Rank, complete Zero Hour South, and one extra secret objective. I do realize that the first two goals are basically us getting through the story, but it's what we need to do to complete the icons, so it's staying there. The objective for the Guildmaster rank in Zero Hour South isn't needed to complete the icon row, but it's definitely something I've been wanting to try. Uh, yeah, future Indutro here, I wish I hadn't put this objective at the start, this was pretty painful. Mystery Dungeon veterans would probably agree with me, you'll see why in a bit. And we're all set. Before we take the quiz, do leave a like, comment, and sub if you like the content. It greatly helps with the algorithm and channel discoverability. I really wanted to play this game as Pikachu again because of his moveset, so I lied on a couple of the questions to get a Pikachu. It took a couple of tries, but we finally got our desired starter and picked a Mudkip as our partner Pokemon. The game started with a scene of distress, with two characters seemingly struggling for safety during a murderous storm. The tone then shifted with a scene of our partner Pokemon, Mudkip, failing to muster up the courage to ask and join Wigglytuff's Explorer's Guild. As it is in these games, Mudkip exited the scene, followed by two ominous-looking bunch. Mudkip would eventually find our amnesia-ridden former human player, washed up on the nearby beach, and shook us to consciousness. The Zubat and coughing tailed Mudkip to the beach and stole his precious treasure, prompting Mudkip to ask us for help. And help we did, joining the Mudfish to Beach Cave. In this video, I'll greatly simplify the plot elements for the most part to keep the video from being a plot recap. I've done that video previously. Be sure to check it out. We got through the cave fairly quickly, beating the two poison goons in record time. After retrieving the relic fragment, we agreed to accept Mudkip's offer to form an exploration team and brave the entrance of Wigglytuff's guild. We were introduced to many of the guild's quirky members and were briefed in the duties of a guild apprentice. We then retrieved Spoint's Pearl and were ripped off of our rightful earnings. The rest of the opening hours were spent getting acclimated with Treasure Town and encountering our first boss of the game, the bad bad Drowsy who wanted to prey on the little Azuril. This incident was also where we first discovered our Dimensional Scream ability, one where it enables us to peer into the past and the future. Why do we have it you ask? Watch my other video. <laughs> In any case, the Drowsy was sent to prison if they have one here. In the dawn of the second hour, we were told to do Sentry Duty, a minigame where we have to guess a Pokemon's footprint. Getting a high score meant we get better goodies, a nice minigame here if you're tired of all the exploring, which we had to do a lot to advance the story. It was finally time for Team Pokefuls to go on an official assigned exploration, so off we go to Waterfall Cave. We touched the waterfall and gained a lot more plot, and advanced to the end of the dungeon where we got sent flying. The dungeons so far have been very manageable, with the first monster house only being available later on at M Plains. The guild announced a formal expedition, and Mudkip sure was eager to participate. But off we went to do more jobs to advance the story. The poison goons from earlier made a comeback, more sentry duty, and the formal introduction of Team Skull's leader, Skuntank. They announced their own participation in the upcoming expedition and looked pretty keen to ruin our chances. We kept on doing more jobs, while the three obvious baddies raid the guild's larder. This prompted Shatot to send us over to Applewoods to fetch some perfect apples, resulting in Team Skull pulling a fast one under our very own feet. That night, we got sent to bed without dinner. At the sixth hour, we learned about recycling and got back to doing jobs right after. Lots of jobs at that, coupled with the odd sentry duties here and there. Nearing the end of the hour, we got a cutscene of Wigglytuff revealing that everyone can go on the expedition after all. Somewhere during this time, we earned enough points to go up to silver rank. Teamed up with the affable Bidoof, we traversed hell on earth. Not really, it was pretty smooth sailing. We were the last to make it to the base camp at Fogbound Lake, resulting in a scolding from Shatod. The further we get into the story, the more challenging the gameplay got. The weather in Fogbound Lake is perpetually foggy, rendering our electric attacks weakened. Well, I say challenging, but it's still a relatively early game. We received more plot advancement and saw Team Skull get their just desserts. We went up Steam Cave and defeated an imaginary Groudon, finding the true treasure of Fogbound Lake. 
No, not the time gear. It was literally the friends and journey we made along the way. Back to life as a slave. I mean apprentice. A famous explorer came by and flexed on us, and we went back to doing jobs to increase our explorer rank as fast as possible. We only took the jobs with high points payout, so we had no time for the common peasants. S rank or above only gang. We ran into the famous explorer again back in Treasure Town, where he was being very kind. We received a quest from the Azuril and Meryl siblings to retrieve their water flow at, unknowingly walking into a trap set by Team Skull. We had been set up to receive the wrath of this Manectric and his gang, resulting in a very dire situation. This fight really demonstrates the importance of room AoE attacks, showcasing their usefulness in a crowded battle room. Even though we managed to defeat this electric gang gang, Dustnor, the famous and very kind explorer, in case you forgot, had to come and save us. After the ordeal, we went back to town and tried to gather info about our past and ability, to which Dustnor was very happy to help. Look, doesn't he look happy? Up until this point, I haven't mentioned the fact that there are vital cogs that retains the planet's stability, things called time gears. Simply explained, they're needed to keep time flowing. Yeah, those are being stolen by someone called Groval. The guild's next mission is to catch this said uh, Groval. More time gear thievery goodness, we're off to investigate places. But before that, we spent a really good chunk of time just doing jobs, eventually increasing our rank to gold rank, really making our way up society here. Back to the story dungeons we go, finishing off Northern Desert. We came up short at first, but our Dimensional Scream ability came in clutch once more and showed us the way again, pointing us to Quicksand Cave. We had a team of Exeguidor and Taurus, a really solid hard-hitting duo. They have decent move pulls and stats, making them a really nice early game choice for me. We went through the dungeon without much trouble, I totally wasn't panicking at the sponsor house, yeah. We finally ran into this legendary scrub, guarding the time gear. This mesprit was easier than the monster house. The psychic scrub ate dirt, and the time gear was stolen by Groval. Bummer. Back at the guild, everyone was extremely worried about time stopping and whatnot. We really just wanted to go back to exploring and raising our ranks. It was crucial that we differentiate ourselves from the peasants. But that had to wait, for we had to go to Crystal Cave and deal with some more plot. We ran into two monster houses, solved the puzzle with our dimensional scream, won a boss fight but still losing in the cutscene, and ultimately blacked out while witnessing Dusnoir chasing after Groval. After we came to, Dusnoir revealed to everyone in Treasure Town that Groval is a criminal from the future, and that he indeed was from the future as well. That didn't matter to us too much, really. We had to be raising our ranks some more. Unfortunately, that again had to wait a bit, as news of Groval's capture came to the guild. Everyone hurried over to Treasure Town as the heroic Dusnor said his goodbyes, and called us forward for a final word. Or not, as he dragged us in the time portal. We almost got executed, followed and saved Groval, and learned that he's the good guy all along. Dusnor was really a henchman of uh, Dialga gone crazy. After encountering a quite thirsty Celebi, we learned that we were Groval's human partner all along. We went back to the present time once more after defying Primal Dialga. We sneaked into Mudkip's hideout in Sherpedo Bluff because of Groval's wanted status and began working to gather the time gears again. Turned out we kinda need those to save time. We ended up needing more manpower to gather information on Temporal Tower and showed up at the guild again. We explained the whole dire situation and got the whole guild behind us, getting more hands on deck. Mudkip's relic fragment suddenly revealed itself as a key item in this whole ordeal, and off we go to Brine Cave. I do realize that I'm skipping a lot of plot details. This should keep the video from being too plot oriented. I figured we could go ahead and finish the main bulk of the story, clearing Temporal Tower first before we rank up and outshine the rest of the peasants. Long story short, Shatar proved himself a hero once more, we rode a magical Lapras, reached the Hidden Land, and defeated Dusnor in a fair fight. Some really really heavy and great plot happens here as Groval performed the ultimate self-sacrifice. We scaled Temporal Tower and ended Dialga's rampage, putting the time gears back into place. We were a bit underleveled for this fight, so this took a lot of tries. It was pretty troublesome going up the tower from the checkpoint every time we lost the battle, really. Finishing this fight took all the items I carried up here. Dialga's roar of time is honestly pure rage inducing. Dialga regains sanity after the boss fight, and I'll save you guys a tear jerking ending. All you need to know for this video is hello, we're back in action. By back in action, of course, I mean more guild shenanigans. We were finally able to graduate from being apprentices, called on to take the guild's graduation exam. Wigglytuff called on us to head to Limonus Spring, all the while advising us to be wary of the Grandmaster of All Things Bad. Of course, the Grandmaster of All Things Bad turned out to be Wigglytuff himself and the other guild members. Thanks, Bidoof. So here is where my preference of Pikachu really shines. At level 37, Pikachu learns Discharge. 
It's just a really convenient tool for clearing out monster houses and boss fights with multiple enemies, making fights like these a lot easier. And its accuracy is also quite decent, making the move land most of the time, unlike Thunderbolt or Thunder. After beating Wigglytuff and the other scrubs, they dashed out out of the pit and we came to Illumina Spring only to find that we weren't able to evolve just yet. The other team members we recruited can though. Despite Mudkip's rather thick-headedness, we graduated from the guild and moved back into Sharpedo Bluff. Now we can truly take on jobs that will set us apart from other exploration teams. Somewhere along the journey, we managed to recruit the Stratini here, and I was determined to level the Stratini all the way up to level 55 to evolve it into a Dragonite. Spinda Cafe was in an uproar, and called on many of the exploration teams to come. Apparently, the way to Shaman Village had been cleared, and explorations to Sky Peak were now possible. Somewhere along the way, our exploration team had apparently gone up to Diamond rank, and now Super rank. I must have missed recording the moment we had ranked up to Diamond. Now we were only about 7 ranks away from Guildmaster rank. We began our 23 by going to the village where all the shaman resided and got ourselves acquainted with one particular legendary hedgehog of grass. Getting through Sky Peak was a bit tough considering our type disadvantage and we had to experience failure a number of times. Sky Peak has 40 floors in total with 10 stops in between. We can see the explorers from Treasure Town gradually make their way up as well, stopping for breaks at said clearings. Team Pokefools was able to settle some disputes between the locals and the exploration teams all the while making their way to the peak. The boss battle for Sky Peak was yet another group battle, and our discharge proved invaluable yet again. We had extra help for the first time, making this battle quite manageable. The Shaman is pretty weak, so we have to make sure to shield the little bugger from any incoming damage. At the end of the battle, we pretty much just left it to the other exploration teams, so life was good. The group of mocking Grimers had apparently moved into Sky Peak because it got so nasty, thinking it was their home. They seemingly had no intentions of trespassing, so all was resolved amicably. We took in some nice views at the top and flew down on Skyform Shaman. We got word from this Mr. Mime that some world famous scissor was stuck in Blizzard Island, but we had other things to worry about, you filthy clown. Our team took on a great number of jobs with Dratania and Beldum, our newest usable recruit, and gained enough exploration points to rank up once more. We were now of the Ultra rank, distancing ourselves even further from the peasants of Treasure Town. You thought it was time to save Scizor to advance the post-game story? Well, think again, we took even more jobs to advance our rank. It's well worth noting that Dratini had evolved to a Dragonair by this point, and we had earned enough points to raise ourselves to Hyper rank. Five more ranks to go. Off to Blizzard Island we go to rescue this so-called world-famous explorer. Not much really posed a significant threat to our team, aside from the gang of pillar swines that spawn occasionally. Thankfully, when our electric moves fail us, Mudkip was there to save the day with his water moves. Upon finishing Blizzard Island, it turned out that we had to clear one more dungeon to reach Scizor. Crevice Cave was almost the same like Blizzard Island, but harder. There were abnormal weather conditions, stronger Pokemon, most notably the Mamoswines mucking about. There were about 15 floors in total, and we finally reached the boss of the dungeon, Frostlass. Frostlass embodied the traditional Japanese Yuki Uno folklore, trapping the Scizor in endless ice. We threw some seeds at her and ended the fight pretty quickly, thawing Scizor out from his ice prison. Scizor revealed that it had been decades since his imprisonment and conferred us the secret exploration rank. This doesn't really add up to our final goal of Guildmaster rank, so I'll just put it as a side note. However, this rank does allow us to get missions for the 7 treasures, which we'll get more into in a short bit. We were able to return to taking more higher rank jobs after this, tallying up more exploration points. In order to avoid wasting time and in-game days, I tend to gather high ranking jobs for one dungeon and finish it in one go. That way, on a very lucky dungeon run, we were able to rack up as much as 3000 exploration points or more. Missions in Blizzard Island and Crevice Cave tend to be 6 or 7 star missions, making them a ripe location to look for jobs. With this method, we were able to go up to Master Rank near the end of the 30th hour, and the Master 1 star rank near the end of the 31st hour. Things were going pretty well, if I dare say so myself. Sunflora had mentioned something about getting treasure at Surrounded Sea, so off we go to advance the post-game story. The Pokemon in this dungeon were easy prey for our electric type attacks, so getting through this was good fun. At the end of Surrounded Sea, we found a peculiar egg and decided to take it home with us back to Sharpedo Bluff. The Pokemon that hatched from the egg turned out to be a Manaphy, and after consulting Shatot, we decided to keep the Manaphy and raise it ourselves, at least for the time being. We had to go back and forth between Treasure Town and Craggy Coast to secure multiple blue gummies for this baby Manaphy. This honestly didn't take very long, but it sure felt like it did. The baby Manaphy ended up falling sick because of the non-native environment he was brought up in, prompting us to head over to Miracle Sea to obtain a cure-all of Fion Dew. Shatot sure knew his stuff. Miracle Sea was another water-type dungeon, so our Pikachu here had a blast. 
The boss fight at the end was a lonesome Gyarados crook, and this fight was just sad. The Gyarados got absolutely blasted by three shockwaves, earning ourselves a nice and cooked Koei fish. We were able to cure the Manaphy with the Fion Dew, and sent off the baby to the sea under the care of a mighty Wolrein. I'll spare you guys another tearjerker scene. Mudkip foreshadowed another meeting with Manaphy, and we went back to our business of showing peasant exploration teams what's what. At the end of the 33rd hour, we were able to rank up to the Master 2 star rank. Good times. A Master Rank exploration team came to visit Wigglytuff at the guild, not knowing that another top tier bona fide Master 2 star rank team stood beside them. That's right, this Pikachu and Mudkip. Make way. They brought news of some treasure at Aegis Cave. I wasn't really looking forward to this bit, honestly. This was going to be the part where we fight the Regitrio and the Regigigas, coupled with all the stupid unknown key puzzles. I hate this part. So we put off Aegis Cave for a bit and did enough jobs to take us to Master 3 star rank. We have one good news and one bad news. The good news is that we only had one more rank to climb to, and the bad news is that it's going to take us at least 75,000 exploration points. Previously, it only took about 3 to 4,000 points per rank, so this is definitely a huge jump. No matter, we'll keep at it until we get the Guildmaster rank. Right, hour 35, Aegis Cave. Team Charm decided that we should have a little contest. The one who gets to the end first wins. Except that I don't want to do this contest, I hate this dungeon, with all available fibers of my being. To advance through the dungeon, we have to get the corresponding unknown keys from the dungeon, four floors for every puzzle. The first puzzle spells ice, so naturally we have to defeat the unknowns from the dungeon that spells ice. Except that these unknowns don't always drop a key upon their defeat, and the specific unknown letters we need don't always spawn. My god, this was painful. If we couldn't get it during a run, we'll loop back to the puzzle room to replenish our HP and PP, and back in we went. We finally got the ice puzzle done, and continued onwards to find that now we would need the rock puzzle pieces. Kill me already. After looping about 4-5 to five times, we were able to get the rock pieces and beat the red rock without much trouble. Next up was the steel one, same thing, reds and repeat until we get all the necessary unknown pieces and pray to Satan that we have the right one. Some of the pieces look quite similar too. Team Charm was apparently unable to beat the Registeel and allowed us to move forward first. The Registeel fight was easier than the Regirock one and we ventured deeper into Aegis Cave. At the deepest part of the dungeon, we found Regigigas and his henchmen, the bosses for this long and unnecessarily painful dungeon. Team Charm joined the battle and with them being fairly strong as well, this battle was nice and easy. Our discharge took care of most of the enemy and the rest was history. Our victory opened the path to concealed ruins and we all had a good laugh at the end. Except for me, of course. We could come back here and go through the whole thing again to recruit the three Regis and Regigigas, but that was a thought I didn't even entertain. Never again. At the end of the 37th hour, we finally witnessed the beginning of the post-game's end. That's right, it's the anti-suicide message, Darkrai and Cresselia part. We started to get dreams telling us that we should unalive ourselves, major gaslighting segment here, but we continued on with our daily activities of outshining the peasants nonetheless. The gaslighting came under the form of dreams, where Cresselia kept telling us that we shouldn't exist in this world because we were formerly a human that came from the future, or something along those lines. Azuril came down with a terrible nightmare that he couldn't wake up from, and we were tasked with finding Drowsy at Mount Travail. Remember Drowsy? Yeah, this uh, R. Kelly Drowsy here. Mount Travail was a bit tough considering the Pokemon's types, but we finally made it to the peak and employed this reformed Drowsy. We completed our preparations and dived into the dream, fighting through the hostile Pokemon that lives inside Azuril's... dream. Makes total sense. We met Cresselia again at the end, the very same one from our dreams, and she kept telling us to unalive ourselves yet again. Apparently Mudkip had been having the same dreams, and he too had been pondering whether he should unalive himself. Drowsy came at the right time, prompting the Cresselia to flee. This Cresselia was acting mighty sus. Back at Sharpedo Bluff, Mudkip pondered upon recent events and the necessity of his existence, and we told him not to unalive himself because the Cresselia seemed off. During information gathering, Lapras told us of the existence of Palkia, the Elga's space counterpart, though he didn't know where Palkia resided. Luckily, that night Palkia came to us and yeeted us off Sharpedo Bluff. Palkia threatened to kill us, but we fell into his dungeon instead. You know the drill, creepy dungeon, monster houses, wipes. God damn. We finally made it to the end though, and faced off with Palkia. Palkia couldn't withstand the power of the sleep and stun seeds we brought and lost the battle. It was revealed that Palkia was told to end our existence by Cresselia in its dreams, the very same one who came to finish the job. Then another Cresselia came along, and the imposter Cresselia turned out to be... Darkrai. If you haven't played this game before, you might be surprised at the number of plot twists. Darkrai beckoned us to come meet him at Dark Crater, a most clear display of a trap. 
but we must go and stop Darkrai nevertheless. We did some jobs before that to rack up some more exploration points though. Priorities. At the dawn of the 40th hour, we had Dark Crater. Dark Crater in itself isn't a difficult dungeon, it was just a lot more difficult because of Cresselia. When I say a lot more difficult, I mean exponentially more difficult. She just kept dying, the very definition of a glass cannon. You can imagine my despair when we ran into this monster house halfway through the first part. We did make it to the end where we found the dark agent of the night himself, Ejirai. He explained that this game basically happened because of him. He perpetrated everything. From the accident that turned us into a human, the time gears, Dialga going nuts, that scale of everything. He even tried to hypnotize us at the end, but the power of friendship prevailed. This boss battle was another one of the really crowded boss battles, but we came prepared with Discharge. However, Darkrai also came prepared. He brought on over a Rhyperior, which pulls all electric type moves with Lightning Rod. We were in a bit of a pickle, really. Just kidding, Mudkip ended him with one Hydro Pump. The rest of the battle was us spamming Discharges and Seize to impregnate, I mean, defeat the Darkrai. The Darkrai tried to escape, but Palkia arrived and lent a hand, disrupting his escape in the portal, much like how we turn into a human. And we've done it. We finished the post-game story and well understood that we should never give up. Ending our own stories is never the answer. Tomorrow will always come and we can always live on to fight another day. I scripted this video in a more light-hearted manner because I really do recommend playing this game on your own. It's such a beautifully written game, full of its own quirks and personalities, that I'm sure you'll find hard to not get attached to. Moving forward, Cresselia joined a team, though I'm sure we're not really going to use her. We used this set of hours to really grind for those high reward missions, tallying up points as much as possible. Most of these missions are done in dungeons like Blizzard Cave and beyond, though soon we'll get more places to grind. At the 43rd hour, we had about 62,000 points left to grind and we got this mission for the mystery part. The mystery part is used to spawn legendary encounters in late game dungeons, such as forcing Moltres or Mewtwo to spawn in select dungeons. While I did my best to recruit as many legendaries as I can, it was never a goal to complete the legendary roster. Manaphy made a comeback, all grown up. Manaphy joined the team and told us of this dungeon called Marine Resort, and this scene in particular prompted the possibility of our two starters evolving. If we were to head to Luminous Spring now, we would indeed be able to evolve. I felt like this wasn't really the time, so we put it off until much later. Evolving doesn't really affect much of the stats anyway, aside from the movesets. At the 47th hour, our Matang was finally able to evolve into a Metagross. So proud to see it. If you've played the Mystery Dungeon series, you know how slow the EXP grind can get. The rest of the time was spent grinding for points yet again. When the 50th hour came, it was finally time for us to set our foot in the fabled giant volcano. We had received a secret rank mission from Spinda Cafe, telling us to explore the giant volcano in order to obtain one of the seven secret treasure, the fiery drum. This was a bit tougher than the other dungeons because of the plethora of ground and fire types, not to mention they hit very hard, especially during the times where it was sunny in weather. We died quite a lot here. At the top of Giant Volcano stood Heatran, the big bad fire boss. Heatran itself was easier than going through the dungeon, and we defeated him to acquire the fiery drum. It took a couple of tries, but we also managed to recruit the fire spider thing itself. Afterwards, we spent a fair chunk of time using the mystery part to spawn Moltres in this dungeon, recruiting the legendary firebird. Not long after, we also accepted the Mount Avalanche secret mission and defeated Articuno, obtaining the icy flute. We had to repeatedly scale the dungeon because this Articuno just wouldn't want to be a part of our team. He finally came to his senses and bowed to our greatness. We had about 30,000 more exploration points to go in our 56, so we took the secret mission for the Rockhorn to take a bit of a break. The Rockhorn is located in the World Abyss, a dungeon sprawling 30 floors deep. Compared to Mount Avalanche and the Giant Volcano, this was definitely a step up. The sheer number of traps in late game dungeons is getting worrisome, our team members here weren't the brightest. We would need to invest a lot of gummies to raise their IQs to get the Trap Avoider skill. The World Abyss boss, Giratina, wasn't that difficult of a boss fight, the fight ended a lot sooner than I expected. We got the Rockhorn treasure, and Giratina agreed to join our rescue team. Exploration team. Nearing the end of our 58, we were also able to finish off Shimmer Desert, the shortest one of the treasure dungeons, and got the Terra symbol. Groudon wasn't really keen to join the first time of asking, but he came around eventually. We did more high ranking jobs and had 22,000 points left to get, slowly but surely. We powered through more jobs next, saving helpless worms in avalanche mountains. Not really sure what this little guy did to end up over here. At the end of the 59th hour, we had 17,000 points left to go. Bottomless Sea was next and holy, this was pretty tough to clear. We wiped a good number of times in this dungeon. Bottomless Sea wasn't only long, it housed some pretty nasty Pokemon as well. 
This absolutely unassuming artillery managed to get the one-up on the team, absolutely decimating our Pikachu with a bullet seed. That was just one example of a series of unfortunate events. As for the Kyogre, the boss battle was quite easy as expected. Our type advantage reigns supreme here. We got to Aquamonica after beating Kyogre, and of course this dolphin didn't want to join us a couple of times. A couple of times, mind you. Progress check. After more explorations and outlaw arrests, we were left with 7,725 exploration points left to go. The end is pretty much in sight. We spent a bit of time walking about and spent this cafe, making gummy blends to raise our IQs, and got a secret message. Not the best secret message, but we'll take it. We accepted the Sky Stairway secret mission next, another 50 floor banger. The Pokemon typing in this dungeon made it a lot harder than the bottomless sea, so this was another painful session. The increased IQ from the team made navigating traps a lot easier though, and we made it to the top after a good number of tries. Taking everything into account, I think we took less time getting through Sky Stairway compared to Bottomless Sea, at least the first time around. The Reiku as a boss fight was doable as expected, and we obtained the Sky Melodica, another one of the 7 treasures. We did need to run the dungeon again to recruit Rei Rei though. I considered doing the final maze in the Marowak Dojo, but it didn't really yield enough useful items for me to do it. Over at Spinda Cafe, we got our first big prize, and this was something that I had never seen before when I was younger. I never knew we would get this ludicolo dancing cutscene when we win the big one. We got the mobile scarf, a health item that would enable us to walk through walls at the cost of a faster depleting belly. We kept on going on explorations after explorations after explorations until we finally did it. We had enough points to rank up, finally reaching the final rank in the game, the Guildmaster rank. By reaching Guildmaster rank, we had also opened up Inferno Cave for exploration. Not that we ever tried to go for it, but it's still nice to have. We had gathered 6 of the 7 treasures and reached the highest rank an exploration team can get. After waiting a fair bit for the last secret mission message from Spenda Cafe, we finally got the Mystery Jungle prompt. Mystery Jungle sure wasn't harder than Bottomless Sea and Sky Stairway, it only had 30 floors. Typing also didn't play too much into the difficulty, seeing as our levels were probably a bit on the higher side. This treasure dungeon was cleared on the faster side out of all these, and we obtained the Grass Cornet after beating Mew. Mew joined the crew, and we finally gathered all of the 7 treasures, checking off another one of our goals. Before moving on though, we headed back to the Temporal Tower and recruited Dialga after another match. Now, we set our sights on Zero Isle South. Zero Isle is a collection of interesting dungeons, if I were to put it simply. It's comprised of 5 dungeons, those 5 being East, West, North, South, and Center. Zero Isle South is probably the hardest one around, housing 99 floors while resetting your level and only allowing the leader in. We'll get to Zero Isle South in a bit. We challenged Zero Isle East first, which allowed our whole team to go in. The first 16 items in our bag were also allowed, so we had some leeway going in. My strat going in Zero Isle East was compiling fully evolved Pokemon at the start with good move pools, so I experimented with the team composition for a bit. Somehow in some way we cleared Zero Isle East after much frustration, though I feel like luck was a lot on our side. Honestly, Zero Isle South was extremely painful. We were only allowed one Pokemon, no items, and our level were reset upon entering. I tried with a bunch of legendaries to no success, and I pulled the real gamer move. I looked it up online. Of course. So I tried out the true and tested Smoochum strat which came from the user Unknowninator over on GameFAQs. This worked well enough, I think. We spent a long long time trying to get acclimated to how the dungeon works, and it really never got less painful than how it started. Smoochum had a good moveset to counter strong opponents and monster houses, working well for a good chunk of time. It was still impossibly difficult though, as one would expect. The majority of the last 15 hours were spent bashing my head against Zero Isle South's walls in frustration. In the end, I never managed to properly finish this dungeon before the 100 hour mark ran out, much to my disappointment and dismay. I wanted to see what lied at the end though, so I used safe states to abuse orbs for items and the stairs. This run had a lot of joy seeds and good EXP, so we unofficially cleared Zero Isle South. This didn't really count towards the real goal, so we'll leave Zero Isle South unchecked. After all that, we have come to the end of this journey. We headed on over to Luminous Spring and evolved Mudkip into a Marsh Top and then a Swampert. I feel like our partner Pokemon's evolution really marked the end of my adventure with these two. In a way, it also symbolizes my own growth since the time I played this game for the first time. As much as I would like for things to stay the same, they never will. We'll all grow into another version of ourselves every single day, and we'll all come to a time where we have to move on from what we have. As a kid, this game taught me to keep trying no matter the circumstances and that we all have our own place in this world. If you made it this far into the video, I am really grateful you've stuck around for this long. I wish you the best in your endeavors and don't forget, we're all going to make it, bros.